That's it. Why it comes to that. How's this? It gives you focus. So it, it, you may not need a mic in a small room like this, but it gives the room focus. All eyes are on you. <laughs> so I'm going to do two poems this afternoon. Wartime, more stories. We are rocked to sleep on the breasts of angels and wake in a field of buttercups translated from the Dutch. Wartime hunger hunts down our pet rabbits. At first, the sound is far off. By supper time, it cannot be ignored. Dogs hunt down our pet rabbits, named for the men who might save us. Monty, Eisenhower, Alexander. We devour them in tears. That night, our little town is bombed. Angels scatter and we cannot sleep. We keep watch on the shore, waiting for the tide to turn. Something, anything, out of the blue. The stars fade slowly until there are none. Then dawn lifts her rosy head, one soft, defiant flower. I need to know, who drained the deep lakes of Russia until there was only dust to slake the thirst of seagulls? Who killed all the fathers and uncles, even Vanya, and forced the sons to squabble over adult entertainment, or worse, to sit cross-legged in the vestibule, mewling over funding? Who stole the wheels off mother's cart and her courage and stranded her children on rickety chairs in the middle of the road? Tell me, who? Sometimes if you close your eyes long enough, you can see the trees budding. And under a fog and a winter's ice, I can create but cannot remember a previous night's inspirational words. Slush-covered fields look designed to stop anyone from walking further. As jets fly through fog, they remind you how far they'll travel before you make it to the street corner. I'm walking a path that probably could use a billboard. If you were welcome here, there would be a sidewalk. The rumble of trucks and water they spray keep my misery running. I'm an urbanite trying to survive on a bus pass in the suburbs. The street corner is a mountain, the kind you climbed as a kid after a snowstorm, thinking you'd accomplish something only to have the mountain collapse. Solus is a huge co concrete parking lot bound cloud.
All right, um, this is called uh, Bellingham, Washington. The carpet and blanket stains have poetry written all over them. The sun off the highway, 49.99, complete with a pool and the couple fornicating in it late at night. A motel representing my birth month. I'm a Gemini, do the month, do the math. I'm in a motel with a woman in northern Washington state. The Alaskan beer we bought is gross. Rather than copy the couple, we're in separate beds, in pajamas, watching the Weather Channel. And then watching shows about heroism of troops protecting America during shows about nine-year-old kids getting $38,000 birthday parties. As the highway traffic keeps me awake, it's safe to predict those kids will never grow up to be cleaners of this motel's pool. she doubled the number of submissions and made Voices 212 and Anthology financially sold. That's wonderful. Uh, she hosts Shab Esher, uh, Poetry Night. Shab Esher is Iranian for Poetry Night. Uh, the most diverse poetry series in Toronto, bringing uh, together people from different ethnicities, nationalities, religions, or lack thereof, sexual orientations, ages, and poetic voices, visions, and styles, which is absolutely true. And it's one of the best attended poetry events in Toronto. She gets up to 70 people. It's on Markham Street at uh, Beit Satu. Yes. And it's on the last Tuesday of every month. Um, and uh, it's just a fabulous evening. There's coffee and treats and a lot of open mic and great features. And uh, it's right on the subway. It's right on my path or something. So I do recommend uh, you get on the list and, and try to make it out there sometime and maybe become a regular. Um, and this is very true. She believes her politics is her poetry. Uh, welcome, Van Nusen. hears it before I do. I start to bosom in tears, praying to stop praying. The ritual branch 
of the tree of speech. Roots falling like leaves. Years back, in the land of Azams, my disbelieving body shook at the gropings of the lecherous call to piety. In the land of now, this call to freedom by a slave frees me from separations, shattering questions released by love, shaking roots to the falling fruit. is addressed to one of the most controversial figures you can think of the Prophet Muhammad. It's called Payamdar, which means messenger. You arrived at manhood, submitted to the imperative era in the cave. Your chest crushed under revelation. Your large eyes, the myth of your long hair. You joined the mountain with the city, the thunder with the earthquake, poetry with faith. Defined narrow eyes guarding you against you, the most absent from the earth and the sky. Rasul of love. The next one also had, the, the title of the next poem comes from a hadith or a saying by the Prophet Muhammad. He's quoted to have said, Allahu jamilun ba yuhibu jamal. Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. Love me as you have since you knew yourself. Before tears, after joy. Love me as I am, your verse, your witness, your lover. Seven times on this scene unseen, circle my cabin with bare feet. Let your blood be my pilgrim. Lose me in yourself. Find me in me. Let your book sing my sins. Draw your life around my death. Let prayer flood my waves where faith is free and rebellion is religion. Be with me. Be me. This one is one of the letters to my father. Since I lost him, I've been writing about him quite often. Death is the greatest liar. It tells me you are not here. Tells me we cannot talk. That we never could. And those are all true to you and me. It tells me I haven't told you, tells me not to tell, tells me you cannot hear, and those are all true to life and death. Death is the greatest liar, as it tells the truth I will not recognize, submits me to me, so I never question its truth, so I submit to fairy tales of fear. Death is never true. It cheats us of laughter, robs us of poverty, of pain, of hesitation. It is its own law. And like a dictator, won't hear free speech. It is the greatest lawyer as it defends the truth to death won't close its eyes for fear, 
its truth will not abide. And when I think you have met it already, I think it should be the greatest truth of all to have met you. And that is why it's a lie. Death never lies, but lies at the foot of your truth, telling lies honest to death. I give you up to uphold it. And I fear this lie will prove true. mountain. Every time I forget, I forget. You remember. Time turns eternity around, abstains from vast, baptizes the false. The weakness of my strength is my claim to what I don't have. Confession belies my faith, yet I know you better than a mirror. I'm the broken bone, boast of a stone. Despite the sojourn of belongs, I insist on Tarot, where I am nowhere. Prayers answer God's wish to be desired. Where are you on this mountain? For I am not who I am, even if I speak the tongue of fire. Mine come was not mine come, nor was it yours, remember? We had books back then with sacred grief. Every page cut through our page, every page held us together. In the beginning, there was no beginning. In the beginning, there was the end. We forgot to read with wuzu. We forgot to read by the wall. The sea cannot see for the bombs in its eyes. The cloud is no cover for sleep. Birds have lost their right to land. Your book betrays the beginning, mine betrays the end. No wonder the land is so rich. Blood is the best water. Life is an explosive jacket as I stand between you and broken tablets. Faith was our fall on this land we fight over. This is not henna on our hands. These are not our hands. What is love if it doesn't kill? And don't be loved. Jesus was a Jew. Muhammad was a pagan. Moses washed his hands of the line where an eye was for an eye. Who is your God now? Who is mine? Is it books that divide us, or is it us who divide us? We gored in the name of God, the victor and the victim, the author we didn't read. We chanted in our name, Allahu Akbar, God is greater. Allahu Akbar, you are greater. Allahu Akbar, I am greater, greater than a struggle, greater than love, greater than greatest books in the beginning. There was no beginning. Let there be light in the end. I talk to God a lot. This is letter to God.
You cannot be going east this morning, meeting sunrise with a green bag. Cannot be this late. Would have to be already above the plane, your machete making love to light. You'd have to have drawn your way into headlines. You could not have been Charlie. Would have to be yourself. No safety in protest of millions. You could not have been any but me, fearing that speech is not free and that life is a good price. In this drama, I find myself playing you, the mask, chorus, and spectators. I find myself finding myself your messenger of light with dark skin, inviting siblings of sapphire to the meetings of Moses with the mount. You could not have slept last night. Your eyes rubies robbed of gold. You could not have been listening to the news. Or could you? After all, you are everywhere. Even on the throne you abdicated. You cannot be going west this morning. You would have to have stepped between the sun and the moon, stretched your arms to both sides, and reconciled beauties. You would have to have looked human, assumed gender, age, and race. You would have to have fallen from yourself down among us. And glad I am you haven't. Let blood flow where it should, in the veins to the heart and back. Pick another color to paint your palette. With all checkpoints and suicide searches, with your wrong ID, you cannot be going home this morning. So this is going to be the final poem. I want to be a cannibal feast. Nine Richter doomsday in our ocean bed. Not drowned in oxygen. To this bigger, this bigger. To be one, the only one. This is me you left before you left. This is me you left before I left. I want to be the one who stayed through distance and daggers, silent in the dead of the day, rise at the foam, pulled into the current. Let the wind tame the wolf. Let the moon rise over the sun. Let the skin undress the wound. I want to lead you to the foot of the God that is you, into the words you won't hear. I want you to be everyone I have desired. Break at the banks of the flood. I'm forgetting how to forget. To burn the cold. I'm forgetting. I want to remember. I saw so much I never saw. I saw nothing. I never saw. I want to write so loud my pen moans at the memory. I want to remember who it is I am writing. I want to water this fire to be rebellion, journey from Vesuvius to world. I want to throw away the key. I want prayer to swoon at the ecstasy of your faith. I want to honor your question by never answering it. I want to be a witch who keeps you in awe of yourself, the scars and potions, the ever after of never. I was never wanting in wanting. I want to break the bones of love. Words are worthy. I want the story of how this is a story. I want character to have no plot. 
I want you to come undone, to convert to disaster. I want to remember how to forget, to erase this prose and pretend it wasn't you. I want flowers to speak thunder. I want vertigo to meet me in your hands and explore the jungle under the blanket of doubts. I want rhyme to have reason for suicide. I want you to whirl in the robes of Baghdad in Kesrat. I want to hang on to your rope, twisting torture into the Guantanamo of exile. I want you to be oblivion, to never ask if this was you. I want you to ask, and I want to deny it all. I want you not to believe, to throw away the door, and keep the key. Thank you. washing the world with effusive light, delicate glancing diamonds, but that I was making what I was seeing even as it formed me. Did anything gleam? Perhaps. It was like strands of perceptual DNA locking or unlocking depending on the configuration of patterns. What we see was shaped so far back. It's just that particles and waves are either Apollo or Dionysius, classic or Baroque, clear, boundary, balanced, or coiling, immersive, ecstatic. Perhaps we're traveling the photonic path with a way of understanding that isn't so new, still intoxicated by the speculations of the ancient Greeks. I'm not saying it's not complex how to describe what we're seeing. We fall back on intricate old theories like a beloved comforter. But the point is not in perceiving what you're finding, rather knowing how to find what you're not looking for. Or the bright warmth on my skin, a sun that is not just a physics but a biology, 
I'm playing with you and seeing if I can loop the diamonds dancing on water over your vision sparkling like an interwoven net of nexus points in our multivalent minds that are locking and unlocking in love. Silky, sexy, sheer, over a bed of dreams. Throaty growl, polyglottal, vibrating threads of labial loosened words on the lingual throat. <laughs> Diamonds mitered at the junction we are. <laughs> A few evenings ago, as I sat in the garden contemplating the space between two knots and wooden fans, I realized that bliss is excessive. Just there, just grab it. And then what? The newing wood and carrying water, the falling towers and Georgie's new wood. small space between us is a river of time, and all the world's a jumping jack, waving from oblivion to a separate soul illusion. Down on 32nd Street, the mundane flows on forever. Papa's got a brand new bag, and Shakespeare's in the alley. The space between us seeks resolution. The ongoing cosmic rut there was all space and time. I'm in the garden talking to flowers in all the channels of land. The thing is, I was puzzled that in my room where I'm surrounded by Buddhism, into God's, there's no Jesus. I whirled around, then settled down and realized the thing is you don't bow down to Jesus, you just open your heart and say that was an option. 
You don't bow down to love. You don't bow down to love your own heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open your heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open your heart. Thank you. inspired by Nick Beat uh, when uh, Nick had his um, CD release party, I guess a little over a month, about a month and a half ago, um, I had this idea in my head that I had to write this poem about Jim Morrison. I couldn't understand why I kept, you know, bugging me about it. And then I reflected and thought that um, Nick was kind of like a Jim Morrison character. He was poetic, you know, he was artistic, very sensitive, you know. And uh, so anyways, uh, I started, the next day I started writing uh, little fragments uh, on this poem. And I went on the internet and I realized that the next day would have been Jim Morrison's birthday. So, anyways, it's entitled, um, Hey Jim Morrison, inspired by Nick B. Strangely, I felt compelled to write about him today, which would have been his 71st birthday had he lived. Did he witch me up? My great grandmother was a Morrison. Maybe we share a common DNA. And it's ironic because where I live, my street intersects with one named Morrison Avenue. Where did all the rage come from? I watched some cottage, some concert footage once. First time I saw him animated instead of just a voice in a song or static words or pictures in a magazine. His slack shouldered, languid low as he walked off the stage, scowling then forming a faux fist and punching towards the cameraman, just shy of striking his lens. I am the Lizard King. I can do any fucking thing. The stories, so many stories, like the time he phoned Robbie, the guitarist, early one morning, saying, this is God calling, and I've decided to kick you out of the universe. No doubt drunk, and probably over some imagined slight, and the words of the prophet were scrawled in blood inside a bathroom cubicle. No one here gets out alive. Always a prankster, the perpetual teenager, smirking to his friends, walking on a balcony railing, drunk, pushing the limit. Alcohol was his muse, also the great anesthetic, pushing away his pain. Once he was arrested by police who found him passed out on a stranger's front porch and then drunk, in the studio, his body curled into a fetal fold on the floor, pissing his pants while unconscious. Densmore, the drummer, was so disgusted he wanted to quit the group right then and there, the last straw. Manzarek had to coax him into staying. Keep your eyes on the road, 
your hands upon the wheel. The future is uncertain, the end is always near. The stories, so many stories, too many stories, like the time at a party with Janis Joplin, who had been a brief lover, sitting together, laughing, talking nicely at first, Mr. and Mrs. Rock and Roll. Then Dr. Jekyll turns into Mr. Hyde. He grabs her long, straight hair and yanks it. Then she, cracking his head with a bottle of Southern Comfort, knocking him cold, end of the relationship. And she would be dead before him. He told his lawyer, defending him for indecent exposure in Miami, the reason he did it was to get back his parents in their home state, to shame them, because, he said, his father had molested him. And when he told his mother, she called him a liar, did nothing about it. Then there was the other time when, allegedly, the rear admiral, trying to administer army discipline, chased him around the house with a baseball bat. Jim had to challenge authority at a very early age. Father? Yes, son. I want to kill you. Mother? I want to. He was a Sagittarius, the archer, cocking his bow, half man, half horse, poised to release the arrow, the most philosophical of the zodiac signs. He had an IQ of 149, but not enough brains to think of the future, or maybe too many. One of the first anti-establishment royals. Is everybody in? Is everybody in? They found him in his bathtub in Paris, dead, a smile on his face, a trickle of blood coming from his nose. Not quite so beautiful or young or Adonis-like anymore, but happy, maybe for the first time in his life. This is the end, beautiful friend, the end. This is the end, my only friend, the end. Hey, Jim Morrison, why did you sin? Hey, Jim Morrison, why did you sin? Hey, Jim Morrison, why did you sin? Morris, sin. Thank you. and I love having poetry readings on Fridays and Saturdays, but I'm always on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I have to worry about going back <laughs> the next day. I'm going to read a suite of poems that I submitted to the Austin International Poetry Festival. I had the honor of uh, featuring it that last year. I'm not going to be able to go this year, because I'm going on the Poet Train, uh, which is the week after, in April. If you folks want to know about the Poet Train, uh, come and talk to me at intermission. Uh, the first poem uh, I wrote in Stuart Ross's workshop, it's, uh, came, the title came from a line in the poem Tour Gavada Beach, written by Robert Earl Stewart, and which appears on page 106 of his book, Something Burned Along the Southern Border, published by Mansfield Press in 2009, and he gave me written permission to use this, and i got to send this poem soon. This is The Blue Bottle Fly Trapped in the Blue Bottle. I've never read this before. Blue Bottle Fly Trapped in a Blue Bottle. It had gone off course disoriented by the heat of a summer night, the odor of a mosquito-repellent torch, or the loud music of a backyard party. A boy up past his bedtime picks up the bottle to show the blue bottle fly to his sister. She cringes but doesn't look away, not the reaction he wanted. He reaches back to throw the bottle, ignoring his imploring sister, guaranteeing he will do it. The bottle twirls through the heat of the night air, through the smoke of the torch, vibrated by every pounding note of the loud music at the backyard party, further disorienting the blue bottle fly, trapped in the flying blue bottle. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Uh, my younger brother uh, came back home at the end of October. I hadn't seen him in over 10 years. I wrote this poem in honor of his 40th birthday, which was six years ago, and it's 35, sorry, in, in, in honor of his 35th birthday, which was six years ago, and it's 35. My brother has turned on a milestone, nearly as bald and old as I am. While I remember hearing him say, don't trust anybody over 35, I know he yet still has 364 more days to become unreliable. <laughs> Thank you very much. And this one, uh, people who have been uh, knowing me reading back in the days of the Renaissance Cafe and that have heard me read this uh, many times. I haven't read it in quite a while, but it seems appropriate since well, I submitted it to the Austin Poetry Festival and it's two weeks to Valentine's Day. It's called Unattainable. It's not that she's way out of my league. Successful, popular, widely admired, empowered, wise, mature, beyond her years, though she certainly is. It's not that she has many friends and well-wishers. <coughs> Would-be suitors would sell out, would shell out three days pay for dinner, a dance, and a dream to spend eternity with her, though she certainly does. This couldn't be the first song sung for her, sweet portrait or exquisite depiction of her heart-shaped face and rare haunting eyes, which cannot begin to do her justice. Am I in my ardor the only one who can truly see past her considerable trappings to all I wish to ensnare? With diligence I await what shall come to be, yet ready to curse or do worse to any who would dare. I am just a humble poet living, my workaday life of dateless wonderment, <laughs> with nothing to offer her but these words, where they come from, and everything they stand for. When I say unattainable, it's not because I am afraid of feeling like this. For the first time, perhaps the last, dare I to rush my steps like a fool. It's because I trust in who she is and who I am, and that we could discover together something entirely unfeasible and unreasonable to all who do not know how to believe. Thank you, everybody. here 
and not from here. So, um, this one's called uh, Yet. The world doesn't know me yet. We must live together. I am not keen on early morning confessions or being judged according to plan. Windowless, comprised of five in a four-cornered room, the barking dog wants to sleep. Am I being slowly poisoned, or is this the end? Do my sleeping eyes weep? Love me, or dress me? It's a dangerous dream. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. It was wonderful. And I do hope you come back and share Thank you. more of your poetry with us. Okay, we're going to take about a There we go. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have uh, a very special lady featured next. Um, why is she special? Because we both went to York University way back, and we took workshops with Irving Layton, and we were both in a little publication that he did called Shark Tank. And we loved each other's work, and we never met until uh, one of the Guernica launches, and it took a while for us to figure out that we had this incredible connection. It's wild. It's just fantastic. So Toronto's Karen Shenfield has three books of poetry to her credit, um, and I've read them. They're amazing. Um, published by Guernica Editions, The Law of Return. Uh, in 99, The Fertile Crescent, uh, 2005, and My Father's Hands Spoke in the Edition, 2010. Um, they're really finely crafted poems. Uh, they're, they're very warm and sensual, and, but there, there is an intellectual undercurrent to them. There's an intellectual muscle. Um, they're beautifully written. Her poetry is being published in numerous poetry journals in the USA, UK, South Africa, Bangladesh, and Canada. She won the 2001 Canadian Jewish Book Award for Poetry and was long listed for the Remit Award in 2005. Congratulations. Yeah. Along with being a poet, Karen is a widely published magazine journalist, editor, both print and screen, and filmmaker. And you've got a showing of your garden coming up at the Heliconian Club yes. uh, on a Wednesday afternoon, a couple of weeks. February 25th. February 25th. I'm going to go if, if anybody else uh, is free that afternoon. Lovely. Um, her indie documentary, Il Garden. That's it. That's oh, it. that's it. That's it. Uh, Gardens of Little Il Italy, screened at several film festivals, including Planet in Focus. Karen is currently working on her fourth book of poetry, two documentary films, and a screenplay for a feature which is being optioned by Canadian director Bruce McDonald, a very oh, wow. busy lady. Yeah. Welcome, Karen. Yeah, well, lots of things are optioned and they don't get made, so we'll see what happens with that. He's wonderful to work with. Actually, he was wonderful. So thanks, Brenda, so much for having me here. It's really interesting when you pick a selection of poetry, how sometimes, accidentally, it resonates with what your colleagues read. And I think, Banu, you will, although I think one of the poems you once heard me read, and you came up to me, and it's when you first came to Canada, I think it's the one I chose. If it's not, it's one that resonates with that one. So Banu said she was going to read about religion, and I certainly write from my Jewish heritage. Banu also spoke about um, being um, moved by the death of her father, and this week is actually the 10th anniversary of my father's death. And so I had decided, without knowing what Banu was going to say, that to begin um, the afternoon with just um, a brief evocation.
relation to my father. Brief note to an engineer. Against protocol, I'm wearing your ring, cold circle of iron forged from the tender ruins of a fallen bridge. Its green residue tattoos the curled middle finger of my writing hand. Hmm. <laughs> Companion poem for Elsie. He floats you supine on the sea, your body a small island, strangely human. With compass and quadrant, he comes to know you, charting the elongated coastline of your torso and limbs, your fingers' intimate inlets, riding the charged waters around your face. At dusk, you hear the birds singing bright news of his landfall upon your shoulder to grazing oblivious sheep. He releases you without thought into the sky, your body burning a distant star. With crazed lenses and mirrors, he comes to know you, climbing the mountain into thin air to sight you through night's telescoping eye. At dawn, he names you for a lost sister, found cataloging God's praises at the bottom of a well, sunk in the shoulder of a small island. He strips your velvet skin, your body a holy scroll, carried down the mountain aboard a ship of cloud. From cloisters and alleys, he summons the scholars to interpret the message of your ancient flesh and bones. <laughs> By the way, my husband asked me who Elsie is, and it's of course Leonard Cohen. <laughs> Circumference. It's time, the month, day, hour, of buttercups, wild hesperus, the sun slantwise, pinned to a blue sky between our neighbor's flaming trees, newborn fruit. And there, by the fence, the stake's new shadow, falling on turned earth at a telltale angle, from which we might, should we feel so inclined, measure the wide world. Well, I recently gave my books to Brenda to read, and um, she's read them so attentively. It's interesting to me. I don't know if I've had such an attentive reader. And she told me she was surprised that I wrote so much from my Jewish heritage and even wrote things about from the Bible. Um, so I chose to read this poem for Brenda, and it's in the voice of Sarah from Genesis. And it, it's at the point where Abraham has gone into Egypt because there's been a famine. And Sarah's so beautiful that he fears for his life. So he says, say you're my sister. And he sends her to, the, to Pharaoh's harem. So this is how I imagine Sarah might have felt being <laughs> sent to Pharaoh's harem. They praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. A peculiar twist this, riddle that resists its surprise of resolution, fable with no moral. Drawn from the dusk enclosed by woven goat's hair, the burden of familiar labors. It is months since hand over hand I spanned the cord's reptilian length to host the jar from the well's cool depths walk back to camp with stiff-necked grace. Months since I pounded barley to flour, the cardiac beat of pestle against mortar, underpinning slaps of wind, sat down to pat rounds of bread, roast meat over secretive roots. What 
meaning rests in this sudden turn. Cloistered in a honeycomb of mud-baked brick, I sleep through my days. Only when evening shadows lengthen unseen from retinues of stone and palm do I get up from my mat, my duties distilled down to the pains of dispensing pleasure. The heart strings are tuned to an ambiguous chord. I've shed my wedding veil. I have no shame. I walk naked but for twinned bracelets, anklets, broad collar of gold, quartz fiance, waist chain that orchestrates my moves. How I stink from lilies and spice. It is no God who calls me to his chambers. When he tongues my nipples to attention, my desire rises, I'm bitten as floodwaters. Mm -hmm. so, I think this is the poem that Fanny once heard me read, and most Saturdays, though I didn't go to today, I went to the gym, I shamefully confess. But most Saturdays I go and I pray at this little Orthodox synagogue where actually the men and women sit separately. It's very traditional. And you need 10 men in the Orthodox synagogue to pray. And women, are, that's called the minion. And women are not counted in it. But I wrote this poem about that. The Standing Prayer. Menachem prays standing in a warm rectangle of light. Israel prays with his eyes closed, the pages of his pearled book turning in the breeze of his breath. Nathan prays out loud, his recitation, a river washing over polished stones. Yussi races to the 19th blessing, eager to sit down. Abraham stumbles over the syllables, twisting roots. As Nehemia prays, the crocheted halo of his yarmulke slips from the crown of his head. Kalman prays, stroking his red beard. David prays, shifting his weight from foot to foot, a fighter dodging invisible blows. Oren prays beside his father the fringes of his prayer shawl, almost touching the ground. Shaw prays near the door, the tenth man closing the circle. I pray where I cannot be counted. My praises and petitions, my thanks, heard or not heard, like those of all the rest. called Bathurst Manor. Bathurst Manor is the unofficial name of the neighborhood that we grew up in, and it's around Bathurst and Shepherd. And we have Cy Strong here, who also, I think maybe you said you lived on the edge of the manor. Right inside. Oh, right inside, oh yeah, right inside the manor. So we have some mannerites here, so. South of the manor. Oh, you were, you were the one south of the manor. So that's why I chose this poem. Bathurst Manor. The streets of our childhood carried names of English towns. We skipped up Wilmington to the public school, chanting the blocks aloud. Searle, Brighton, Acton, Home. Home was an L-shaped bungalow floating on a sea of grass. Screen doors slammed shut as we called each other out to play. We didn't miss a beat jumping double dutch on double driveways, our skirts upside down parachutes. We buried our heads in folded arms, counting down from 10 like Cape Canaveral commanders. Alone, I traced my finger along the silvered 
curls of a wrought iron banister. I saw colors tremble in the sprinkler's wane. On our garage's yellow brick, I used a charcoal chip to scrawl a heart, my initial and his. I listened for my ball's bounce, bounding back to my cupped hands as I spun around the world. When the summer air cooled like bath water, we stood behind a sheared hedge, squinting through the deepening dusk to wait for the wishing star. What sadness when the street lamps flickered on and our parents hollered bedtime. We headed in as fireflies flew from ditches, their green luminescence flashing coded signals of their secret selves. Well, Mike read a seasonal poem, so I thought I'd read a seasonal poem too. Also, set in the manner, Confession. No fairy princess me, I never donned the costume, circled skirt of velvet, faux fur frosting, crimson collar and cuffs. Never found my balance, some lack of nerve or skill, couldn't master a simple swizzle, let alone a crossover or one foot glide. Cold hours I kept to the wings, holding close to the rinks, bruised wooden boards, my impossible fear of falling through artificial ice. Truth be told, I stood about more than skated, my ankles buckling in protest. Still, my cheeks flushed, fingers and toes tingled at their tips, as clutching the rail, I lifted my face to the veiled sky. Out of the crowd, one perfect flake of snow, dissolving like sugar on my tongue. So I'm going to read one more poem after this, but I would not be doing my publisher a service if I didn't <laughs> advertise that I have books for sale and I will make you a deal. <laughs> so if I have a greatest hit, it's probably this poem, and I decided to read it for Brenda. I, I, I've really been enthralled by the fact that the burlesque has come back into vogue in Toronto. And I know that a number of artists go and they, they draw at burlesque shows, and people are mixing, bur, uh, mixing spoken word with the burlesque, and um, Brenda's wearing a little corset today, which is burlesque. So I, after Brenda, I thought of ending with this poem. And it's for my grandfather. And he was actually the theater doctor for the burlesque, first burlesque theaters in Toronto, burlesque and vaudeville, at, when it was at the casino theater. And um, he used to go and attend stars and take my mother to the burlesque shows and plunk her dad in the front of um, the seat. And when I was a child and she'd be bathing me, she'd be regaling me with stories about these burlesque stars and what they wore. <laughs> so it's popped up here. And so this is for my grandfather and Zadie and Yiddish's grandfather. Theater doctor. My Zadie knew the show must go on. He was their top banana. Anne, Georgie, and Marjorie, Sally, Gypsy, too. The great girls who gave the boys the business. <laughs> the burlesque house again, Booby asked dismayed, suspecting foul play. Sadie gave his lemon tea a final sip, brushed moon hooky crumbs from flecked mustaches, exited on cue, toting his black leather bag like a prop. Inured to the charms of feminine flesh, he swam backstage with nary a sidelong glance, the palest flush, through schools of chorus girls' soubrettes, shedding spangles, the dust of stars. He cured their ailments, great and small, painted gypsies' tender throat, 
corseted the tiger girls, lower lumbar, daubed mercurochrome upon Sally's breast, her wound accidental, an ostrich feather's errant quill. I heard it said it was he who bandaged the wings of Zerita's doves, the bloodied nose of Rose LaRose. <coughs> Admitted to private chambers, he witnessed transformations, the polishing of nature's gifts. What more was he privy to? Spats with boyfriends, managers, secret longings? musical box and it's for Jim Morrison. A bright box until one day I smashed music with rocks shiny shiny. I woke up, my body heavy, being the surveyor, living underground, a shelter, my face turning blue. I drop in the room, there are voices blowing on the roof, shouting against me, standing, listening to the wind of their speechifying. Under it, by the hand, they hold me up. I hear it. The tears are falling music. It's by Nick Bate, dedicated to the rock star poet Jim Morrison.
the amazing uh, road that he had traveled, and um, also sort of in, in dedication to him being a musician as well. And um, I think you'll, you'll get the idea of what, uh, what, how I feel about the music and everything that he is. this poem and it's called Iceland. Hope you enjoy. I am excited. 
persistence unchanged, detached by mortalities, limitless pulse. In a life well and purely lit, I am comfrey. to Vancouver. Happened in Saskatchewan. In Saskatchewan. And we just actually put it together this morning. So yeah, we're the first people to ever hear it besides our, our rabbits. Oh, yeah. And if you're wondering, we said we have a fluffle of rabbits. Yeah, for a fluffle of rabbits is a, dekest, a domesticated herd of rabbits. <coughs> so we have a fluffle of what? I've seen photographs. Oh, they're they're like four rabbits who live in our furnace room. <laughs> <laughs> Chibu, Fiddy, Hunter, Sun too. So this is called To the Edge. Yeah. Discovers 
not keep all his men supplied with sheep. They hide that pillar, time's so steep. When they get up to it, and who we ride behind tomorrow to be my father's only home.